Hey, how you doing, econ students? This is Jacob Clifford. I'm here at Disneyland, and there he is, the man himself, Walt Disney. Let's talk about the economics of Disneyland. Concept number one, diminishing marginal utility. If you've ever taken an econ class, you'll remember that economists use the word utility to describe the satisfaction or happiness you get when you consume a good or service. This is worth at least 50 utils. You might also remember the law of diminishing marginal utility. The more you consume, the less additional satisfaction you'll eventually get. Think of the teacups ride. The first time you ride it, you get a lot of additional satisfaction. It's fun, you're laughing, you're happy. But as you continually consume this ride and keep riding over and over and over again, you're eventually going to get less and less additional satisfaction. In fact, at some point you would have negative margin utility, which means you wouldn't even voluntarily choose to ride the ride. This concept doesn't just apply to riding the teacups, it applies to everything from eating churros on Main Street to meeting Disney princesses. Now to maximize utility, everyone at Disneyland is doing the same calculations in the back of their minds. For each attraction or ride, they determine the additional satisfaction they expect to receive and divide it by the additional price of that attraction. Now I know you might be thinking, wait, there is no additional price for another ride at Disneyland, all the attractions are free. Once you get in. Well, nope, they're not free. There's a price. And I am currently paying it right now. The price to pay is the lines. That's right. So what you do is you calculate the additional satisfaction you're going to get from any given ride, and then you divide that by how long you have to wait in line for that satisfaction, and then you compare that to other different rides. So that's the reason why you don't ride like Space Mountain over and over and over again, or you don't ride Thunder Mountain like we're about to do over and over and over again. You kind of change it up because your additional satisfaction falls as you ride the same ride over and over. Concept number two, market power. Disneyland has substitutes like Legoland or Knott's Berry Farm, which is less than six miles away, but it's still a rather unique experience. That means Disneyland is a price maker. There's no specific market price that they have to charge. They can charge any price they feel will maximize profits. When Disneyland first opened, it charged for general admission and attractions separately. So you paid once to get into the park and again to buy a booklet of tickets for the rides. In 1982, they switched to a single admission price. So if you go for one hour and ride one attraction, you pay the same price as someone who goes for 12 hours and rides everything. In 2016, they did something new. They adopted a demand-based pricing system. That means they charge a higher price on days when the demand is higher or more inelastic, like on weekends, holidays, and during the summer. So now there's actually three prices. There's peak days, regular days, and value days. All this means that Disneyland, because of its market power, has been able to capture more profit by changing its price structure throughout the years. Concept number three, inflation. When it first opened, the price of Disneyland was about $3.25, which is pretty cheap. But keep in mind, prices and wages were a lot lower back in 1955. I mean, minimum wage was only 75 cents per hour, and back then the average income was around $4,000 a year. That 1955 ticket price adjusted for inflation would be about $29 today. So just to keep up with inflation, Disneyland should be charging about $30 but they're really charging more like $100. 100 bucks, what a ripoff! Now before you grab a pitchfork and storm the Disney castle, keep in mind that adjusting for inflation doesn't reflect changes in quality. That is, the increase in the price of Disneyland tickets can partially be explained through inflation, but it can also be attributed to improvements in the park. The Disneyland of 1955 looked a whole lot different than the Disneyland of today. Back then there were only like 10 rides, zero roller coasters, no Haunted Mansion, no Pirates of the Caribbean. By today's standards, it was boring. Disney executives have done a pretty good job of improving the park over the years. In fact, here's one of their CEOs and what he had to say about that. You can't sit and say, well, it's all great now and beautiful and 10 years from now it'll be the same. It won't be. Time moves on and you have to reinvest. So the rise in the price of Disneyland tickets has definitely outpaced inflation, but they're now two different experiences. The Disneyland of 1955 is a whole lot different than the Disneyland of 2017. Concept number four, the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect is the idea that initial change in spending leads to higher incomes and even more spending the economy. This means that individuals and businesses that you think are unrelated to Disneyland are actually surprisingly interconnected. For example, a hair salon owner might see an increase in demand for haircuts during the summer months when Disneyland is hiring more cast members. In 2015, it was reported that the Disneyland Resort adds $5.7 billion to the Southern California economy. It's the single largest employer in Orange County, and it hires a security force bigger than the police force in the city which it's located in. It's just a huge operation with thousands of maintenance personnel, food servers, custodians, don't forget the performers. You, know, you don't think about it often, but that's actually a worker in there, right? So that person is hired 
by Disneyland to work here and they're working in the labor market. Actually, right now, Disneyland is adding Star Wars land, which means hundreds of jobs for construction workers, engineers, and architects. The income generated from all those jobs gets multiplied as those workers spend that money and it becomes somebody else's income. The point is, if Disneyland ever just shuts down and closes, there'd be a whole lot more people than just Disney employees that would lose their job. Economic concept number five, entrepreneurship. Walt Disney was an entrepreneur. In fact, the way he came up with the idea of Disneyland was he sat on this very park bench right here when he took his kids to a merry-go-round and he thought, you know what, maybe there should be a, a bigger place, a better place that's the happiest place on earth. And that's where Disneyland came from, so he made it happen. Disneyland may seem like a sure thing now, but when Walt Disney pitched the idea to lenders 60 years ago, very few of them had faith in his idea. From the very start, it was the problem of getting the money to open Disneyland. And uh, we had everything mortgaged, including my, uh, my family. But it uh, <laughs> takes a lot of money to uh, make these dreams come true. But he didn't just wish upon a star. He kept working and pushing for his dream to come true. Walt, the entrepreneur, was willing to take the risk. Once he finally got funding, he built Disneyland in less than one year and still wasn't sure if it was a commercial success, even on opening day. On July 17th, 1955, 28,000 people showed up to Disneyland and half of them had counterfeit tickets. It was 100 degrees outside and the plumber strike meant that Walt had to decide between having working toilets and having working drinking fountains. He chose the toilets. Also, women's high heels were getting stuck in the freshly poured asphalt and the live TV production floundered. Right, link letter. He's looking for a microphone. He looks all confused. Despite these initial setbacks and the negative reviews, consumers loved Disneyland and supported it with their hard-earned money. Disneyland, the company Walt created, flourished. That's exactly how capitalism is supposed to work. Not only did Walt become extremely rich, his ability to innovate created memories and magic for millions of people throughout the world. So I paid $700 plus parking and food uh, to take my family to Disneyland, and I wouldn't have done so had I not thought it was worth it. So this is a great example of the free market. You know, I spent that money and I must have gotten that satisfaction, or at least perceived I got that satisfaction. But believe it or not, I do it again, because Disneyland is awesome. Thanks for watching, till next time. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe, like, and leave a comment. I love making videos like this. I would make them every single week if I could, if people told me they were worth it. So please share this video, and I promise to make more. Thanks for watching, till next time.